Test, test. Testing, one, two. Testing. Test, test, one, two, testing, testing. Check, check. Can you hear us?
I'd like to get started if possible. Uh, thank you for joining us for the session on connecting and enabling the next billions. This is phase four of a multi-year project. Uh, on, I'm one of the co-conveners. My name is Christopher Yu. I teach at the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, I am happy to uh, open this session on behalf of myself and my two co-conveners. One of my co-conveners is Raquel Gatto of the Internet Society and also a current member of the MAG of, of the IGF. And unfortunately, the other co-convener is Constance Momelier, who is also of the Internet Society, who unfortunately, for uh, other reasons, could not be here today. But she led the entire initiative for the first two, first two years. So her, pre her absence here uh, is not any indicative of lack of support for the project or a lack of appreciation for the contribution she has made to the project. Uh, just to give you the run of show, I will offer a brief orientation of the history of the CENB project, uh, followed by Ms. Radhika Radhakrishnan, who is the consultant on this project, who took the lead in drafting the report, which will, is available on the IGF website for comment and will be revised and released publicly. And so you know the structure of the report. Uh, this uh, entire focus of this year's project is case studies based around four of the SDGs. Um, and in fact, it's consistent with what we've done before. This year, we're focusing on energy, work and economic growth, partnerships, and of course, because it's the IGF infrastructure. And uh, we will, she will be introducing the case studies and the thematic findings we've made from the different roughly 10 or so case studies in each of those areas. And uh, Raquel will have to take our leave. Please join me in thanking her. Anyway. And then we will hear presentations from a MAG member and a person actually deploying each of these initiatives in the field from each of the SDGs. Because we are covering four different SDGs, time will be very much of the essence. So I will apologize in advance for being uh, ruthless in keeping time. Uh, but it was not intended to offend anyone or to take anything away from the important work they're doing. It is just a desire to give as much room for as many different voices as possible. All right. And without further ado, I will introduce the basic project of CENB. If I have the first slide, please. So the CENB is a direct outgrowth of the MAG's emphasis, growing emphasis on intercessional work, and consistent with the spirit of the IGF, really attempting to create a bottom-up approach that builds in many voices from the community. So we uh, chose different forms of uh, focus on different topics each year asked for solicitations from the community, uh, and then took, uh, drafted a report in each of the years, and then asked for input, further input from the community to refine and to amplify on what we've learned. At this point, at the end of all four phases, we've uh, received in excess of 150 submissions from various members of the community. And for that, for everyone who participated in this process, we thank you very much, because none of it would be possible without you. So the, just to introduce to you briefly the four phases, the first began at a very high level about policy, solutions uh, about how to, con and it, uh, how to connect more people to the internet. As is well known, a little bit of more than connected to the internet as of now, and are still seeking to connect more and looking for innovative ways to connect more. And what's quite striking is the first year, it was actually just called Connecting the Next Billions, because we didn't fully appreciate that it's not just a matter of making connectivity available and affordable, but there are other barriers that remain. And second, the most of the input we received was at the national level in the first round, and we discovered that we needed to broaden out the information that we received. That led to phase two in year two in 2016, which literally focused on the different drivers of the enabling environment, looking at things such as digital literacy and other demand side considerations that have come to the fore, but also put a growing emphasis on local and regional interventions to understand exactly how internet connectivity has built one community at a time on the ground. So the first two years were quite abstract and general. The next two years, we actually devoted to being very concrete based on case studies. 
and to try to understand, look at actual implementations of different people on the ground to understand how the projects were working and as I had a brief conversation with Philip earlier and the challenges they face because they, uh, one of the great desires is for us to learn best practices, try to benefit from the experience of others and to understand what the challenges can be and to try to help some people avoid some of the challenges that we've seen before. I look at my friends from GiffyNet, I know they know well the importance of educating the rest of the community about the challenges that wait uh, different projects. And then lastly, uh, in those deep dives, last year we uh, focused on three uh, SDGs, that was gender, education, and infrastructure, and received the report. That report is now available. This year we are focusing on four different SDGs, energy, work and economic growth, partnerships, and because infrastructure is always central to what the internet does, we are doing SDG 9 a second time as well to get as much learning as we can. Uh, that is my summary of the initial process, uh, progress of the four years. I turn uh, the floor over to Radhika, who will discuss this year's findings. Thank you, Professor Yu. Uh, so the draft paper that we have produced for uh, the CENB4 is already up on the website, and it's open for comments. It's open for everyone to view. So I will just briefly uh, go through some of the key findings from the report, but please feel free to uh, go and read the full paper that's uh, up on the website. So as Professor Yu has already mentioned, we are focusing on four SDGs this year. Uh, the first of them is uh, SDG 7, which is to ensure access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all. So the reason we're really looking at this SDG uh, as part of CENB is because the la one of the reasons is because the lack of power infrastructure and grid connectivity really affects uh, how you can connect to the internet. So of course you require power to be able to connect to the internet um, and uh, therefore if you have local access projects that try to advance sustainable energy sources, then we're going to be able to have more people connecting, uh, connecting to the grid. Uh, so I will not go in uh, de yeah. I will not go in detail with respect to the specific local access projects that we've looked at, because we will have speakers also speaking about them today. But I will briefly talk about some of the common themes that we think came about uh, from the submissions that we received this year. So with respect to the case studies dealing with SDG 7, uh, the first common theme was that uh, internet access was used to provide the backbone infrastructure for real-time monitoring uh, of renewable energy sources, uh, such as in the case of uh, Sigora in Haiti, ME Solshare in Bangladesh, and M Copa in Kenya. Uh, we also noticed that uh, internet access projects often uh, provide energy as a complementary service, so that provides additional sources of revenue for a lot of people, such as uh, in the case of the Mavingo networks in Kenya. And thirdly, a lot of the uh, projects that we received submissions for were also private sector led, which meant that there was a lot of heavy uh, reliance on creating markets in areas where markets did not exist earlier. Uh, again, there are, uh, there's a lot more information on all of this on our, uh, on our draft paper, so uh, you can please feel free to go and uh, read that. Uh, so the next SDG we're focusing on is SDG 8, which is to promote inclusive and sustainable economic growth, a full and productive employment, and decent work for all. Uh, again, the relevance of this, the reason we're including this uh, as part of CENB this year is because, as we know, internet access, it has both microeconomic as well as macroeconomic effects, uh, which is what is as envisioned by SDG 8. So at the macroeconomic uh, level, for example, uh, the World Bank estimates that for every 10% increase in broadband access, there is a 0.65% increase in the GDP. And at the microeconomic level, we also have uh, a lot of job creation, uh, uh, access to online freelancing. This is especially beneficial for youth and women who some Sometimes, uh, due to cultural norms, cannot access these kind of opportunities uh, outside of uh, the uh, cyberspace. Um, and some of the common themes that came across uh, through the projects that we received were that uh, the modes by which internet access helped uh, span both the demand and the supply side. So, uh, for example, we saw that in Georgia, the connectivity itself was acting as an enabler, but in some other places like Papua New Guinea, the 
uh, effective connectivity was supplemented through some kinds of training programs and assistance, etc. Um, uh, we also noticed that uh, digital skills training pro programs were used to complement the traditional connectivity. Uh, and we saw this was being especially useful for youth, such as the uh, programs in Nigeria show, and for women, such as uh, the CIDRO uh, shows in, in Peru. Uh, the submissions have also highlighted the critical role uh, that community anchor institutions play. So for example, libraries, uh, they help in creating meaningful, meaningful access and supporting communities' goals in economic empowerment. Um, yeah. So SDG 9 is about building resilient infrastructure, promoting sustainable industrialization, and fostering innovation. Um, internet access provides, uh, it proves to be a key component of thriving innovation uh, and helps to transform industries. We have seen how uh, mesh networks uh, linking to Wi-Fi signals in villages. Uh, now we have uh, innovative technologies such as TV white uh, space spectrum for data use, uh, and a lot of emerging technologies that are being used to help uh, to help industries thrive. Some of the common themes that we uh, came across in these submissions were uh, first was uh, the emergence of community networks, which supplemented the traditional uh, connectivity models in uh, remote areas that are geographically isolated in many parts of the world. Uh, so examples are, again, you can see on the screen, we have, uh, we have in Mexico, Argentina, projects that are aiming to do this. Uh, we also see that uh, there is a lot more proliferation of unlicensed spectrum use as opposed to uh, licensed spectrum approaches. And uh, a lot of the internet connectivity projects were also, the ones that we received were also a smaller scale. They were specifically focusing on certain sub-communities, uh, which really highlights the importance of regional and local specificities as we have uh, been uh, talking about uh, throughout the phases of uh, CENB. Lastly, the SDG that uh, we focus on is SDG 17, which is to strengthen uh, the global partnerships for sustainable development. Um, now, internet access projects uh, facilitate partnerships between different stakeholder groups, and you cannot advance these goals uh, as a single stakeholder, so partnership between different stakeholders is absolutely crucial uh, for attaining all the goals uh, and visions that we've been talking about. Some of the common themes that we received uh, among the projects were first that uh, there were different levels of aggregation that we received projects at. So some were international partnerships, uh, such as the World Economic Forum's Internet for All. Some were regional, some were even local partnerships. Um, and a lot of them had specific issue verticals. So uh, for example, uh, Equals uh, focuses on the issue of uh, di uh, gender digital equality. And uh, we have Joyce today who will be able to speak later on more about this in the session. Uh, some partnerships also had country champions and uh, working uh, group leader, uh, working group coalitions, uh, and some of the submissions also. Some of the submissions also showed uh, how, again, libraries can sometimes be a strategic, uh, uh, a strategic venue for forging these kind of partnerships uh, to further internet access goals. Uh, so that is. Briefly, the highlights of some of the things that we've been working on in our paper, uh, and I'm sure the speakers will add a lot more to this uh, as we go ahead in the session. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Radhika. I mean, just to, he's done ex excellent work pulling together a lot of different threads. Uh, just to give you a little bit more color on the different aspects to get into specifics, on the energy SDG, all of them are solar. Uh, interestingly, one of the uh, different uh, infrastructure projects, though, there is one battery-oriented power system, which is quite different, and it's an interesting model. Uh, we'll see how that works out. Many of the solar projects or the energy projects are fo focused on internet connectivity, but some of them are explicitly focused on agriculture, both in terms of running irrigation system and agro-processing for different uh, facilities. And economic growth, uh, it's, there's a wide, wide range of projects. Uh, some are about engaging in promoting economic activity in mountainous areas. Some are on digital training, as Radhika mentioned, in, based in libraries. Others are based on women, youth, entrepreneurship. Some are offering, one is offering training in law. And uh, another, uh, there's a number of them trying to increase the expertise that farmers bring. 
On infrastructure, as uh, Ronika mentioned, community networks play an important role or an interesting option that people have not fully considered. Uh, we also looked at schools and clinics, different aspects in the case studies, but perhaps the one that's the most interesting is the one where uh, they have Wi-Fi equipped motorcycles that drive around neighborhoods and establish hotspots. And it's an interesting model. Um, we've seen different forms of that in the work that we're doing. One World Connected is actually connect collected over 1,000 innovations, uh, innovative ways to connect more people to the internet, and you do see, see sort of mobile uh, processes that uh, are used to deploy different technologies. Um, just so you know, I, I neglected to mention that um, I am working on the project called One World Connected. If you're interested in more case studies, uh, the Dynamic Coalition on Innovative Ways to Connect People to the Internet is having its session tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. in Sal 8. If you're interested in learning more about that, I encourage you to come and to stop by the One World Connected booth, which is booth number one in the village, where we will actually have handouts, again, providing more and more information about these kinds of interventions. Okay, um, is Wisdom here? No. Is Mary here? Mary. So we uh, are going to change the order of our program because Wisdom is not here yet. So Mary, if I may invite you up now to give your remarks, and Philip, if you would come join us as well. Uh, Mary will speak for three minutes about SDG 8 on decent work and economic growth, and we'll talk about the different policies that countries should put in place. Please join us, Mary. And then Philip has in, is doing a tr uh, deployment of actual Wi-Fi in the Philippines. That's right. And uh, the, one of the things that we're attempting to do with this program, which we did in the last IGF, is not just talk at the high level of generality, but to really bring the people who are deploying these projects in region so they can talk about their experiences, their aspirations, their challenges, and uh, what will lead to provide a map forward on how to proceed. Mary? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Mary, and I'm from Nigeria. Um, first, I want to start by saying that we, have, we all agree that the internet is a, a disruptor. There are legacies, there are issues, and for economic growth, the, it could be, well, good, but on age, uh, uh, SDG 8, decent jobs, so how can we redistribute the gains of innovation, the gains of automation, the gains of, of uh, internet development to be able to distribute fairly to both the innovators as well as the legacy skills. We, are, we witness in my region, uh, in my country, where some health workers refused to adopt new technology because they are afraid they are going to lose their jobs. So now that we are talking about innovation, talking about uh, uh, new technologies, and talking about the economic development and growth, and yet some will lose out, what policies should countries put in place to be able to make sure that they are fairly treated, fairly distributed. How can we start retraining? I am an accountant by profession, but I decided to come to the space of internet, internet governance, ICT, and uh, some, when, you, when they speak to me, they think I'm an engineer. So retraining is one aspect of economic development. So when we gain from the, these new technologies, disruption of uh, automation and new things happening in the space, we should also, on the other hand, give back. The, the, mental, set, the mental set and the orientation, people are afraid to embrace new things because they are afraid they want to keep their jobs. So if we are going to create decent jobs for all, not only that we are seeing new things happening, but also we need to retrain the legacy skills so that we can key in into what is happening currently. 
So that's my, my point. That's the point I'm bringing up. That's the thing we should take home with us. What policy with our countries, with our yeah, uh, organizations, with our communities, what do we do to reorient uh, legacy skills to be able to key into the new development and uh, all of us will hold hands and go and grow together as we develop economically. That's where I'll stop for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary. And I should make to mention, Mary is also a member of the MAG, so thank you for your service to the entire IGF community. Uh, with, uh, without further ado, I introduce Philip, who will share with us his experiences. Hi, guys. Good morning. I'm Philip from the Philippines, easy to remember. Um, the name of our company is Wi-Fi Interactive Network, or WIN for short. We're a three-year-old uh, tech startup uh, based in the Philippines. Um, so our approach is uh, a little bit different because we're a private enterprise, and we're trying to figure out, is there a commercial model out there that we could test wherein we could actually provide affordable internet access to the people that are underserved and unserved. So uh, we've been at this journey for about three years now. The first model that we tested, and I'm gonna share with you the different trials that we've undertaken, just to give you some flavor of what we've tried to do. So the first model that we tested was a model where we would provide uh, internet access through the mom and pop stores based within communities. These mom and pop stores are called Sari Sari stores in the Philippines, and there are different versions in each country. So typically this would be women run, uh, very small um, stores that sell mainly consumer goods like shampoo, soap, uh, milk, and what, what not. So the idea was, what if we provide internet access to consumers in exchange for purchasing preferred brands that would actually pay for the internet access. So we actually uh, worked with a major global consumer goods company, um, Unilever, and uh, they basically agreed to fund the trials wherein every time somebody would purchase a sachet or a little packet of shampoo, we would provide the consumer 30 minutes of internet access. So it's kind of a purchase for access type of value exchange. And um, while it was an interesting and very exciting idea, in fact, it made its way all, uh, all up to the global CEO of Unilever when it was presented to him. One thing that we really learned that was very important was that um, we couldn't attribute the purchase of the specific brand uh, to reward the consumer with internet access. And the reason for this is the small mom and pop stores didn't really have POS systems, point of sale systems, or um, you know cash registers. So we were left to having the store owner or the salesperson decide whether or not the person qualified for free internet because of their purchase. And that wouldn't work for a brand sponsor because it would be difficult to attribute the actual purchase for the internet uh, access reward. So that was a very important learning experience for us. In fact, uh, one of the sponsors even offered to foot the bill and put POS systems in the stores. But unfortunately, in, in my country, people are very tax sensitive. And uh, what that means is that the stores didn't really want a POS system because then their sales will be tracked by the government and will be taxed. So that was another uh, you know, hurdle that we didn't anticipate that we learned from. Um, so moving on from that, we moved to a paid model. And so this time, with the help of Microsoft, we got a grant from the Microsoft Airban Initiative. We set up our own uh, base station. So we decided to uh, broadcast our own Wi-Fi signal in a small town, and uh, we basically put up uh, access points in different uh, houses and stores. And the idea being is that if we um, provide internet access to the stores, they would sell internet access at 20, 20 US cents per hour. And what we learned was that people just weren't willing to pay for internet access. They just preferred Wi-Fi to be free. So if there's any takeaway from this, and I only have a minute left, 
one thing that we've concluded is that uh, providing internet access to the base of the pyramid is not a question of affordability. I think it's a question of sustainability. People don't have the budget to pay for internet access, so we have to develop the business model to be able to give them free access with sponsors and maybe advertisers paying for that access. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, both to Mary and, Phil and Philip for sharing your important perspectives with us. Uh, may I invite Wisdom, you are here? Yes, no, no, okay, is June here? June is here. So if I could invite June and Carlos to come up while please, the audience, if you would join me in thanking Mary and Philip for a very stimulating presentation. Uh, we will now proceed to SDG 9, Industry, Innovation, and Infrastructure. June Paris, member of the MAG, will introduce the importance of the topic, and Carlos Ray Moreno will share with us the important work he's been doing with community networks all over the world. June. Hello, I'm June. I'm from Barbados. Um, we, I'm looking at um, policy number nine, um, policy options for connecting and enabling the next billion, and our topic is actually... Um, how to build resilient infrastructure, promote sustainable industrialization and foster innovation, um, develop quality, reliability, sustainable and resilient infrastructure, including regional and transborder infrastructure, promote inclusive and sustainable industrialization by 2030, raising industry share of employment and gross domestic product, increase the access of small scale industrial and other enterprises, in particular in developing countries, to financial services, including affordable credit and their integration into value chains and markets. Hopefully by 2030, we will upgrade infrastructure and retrofit industries to make them sustainable with increased resource use efficiency and greater adoption of clean and environmental song technologies and industrial processes, with all countries being taken action, taken action in accordance with their respective capabilities. Um, we need also to enhance scientific research, upgrade the technological capabilities of industrial sectors in all countries, in particular developing countries, including by 2030, encouraging innovation and sustainability, increasing the number of research and development projects, workers from, by one million people and public-private research and development spending, make full use sorry, facilitate sustainable and resilient infrastructure development in developing countries through enhanced financial, technological, and technical support to African countries, least developed countries, landlocked developing countries, and small island states. So we also need to support domestic technology development, research, and innovation in developing countries, included by ensuring a conducive policy environment for industrial diversification and value action to commodities. Significantly increase access to information and communications technology and strive to provide universal and affordable access to the internet in least developed countries by 2020. So, how can we make this possible? Let's see if we can find some changes here. Um, how can we build resilient infrastructure and promote sustainable industrialization and foster innovation? So, um, so we need to get structures that are resi resistant to natural disasters, war, and open to entrepreneurship. We also need to encourage partnerships and village investment, have debates and inclusive inclusiveness using a bottoms-up approach, include polytechnics and places of learning so that promotion reaches everyone not only universities. We also need to build and support credit unions, offer small business loans, and involve participation from governments. Reach out to villages and give them a voice. Encourage bottoms up participation to prevent elitists. Um, also, make full use of research development at universities. Give opportunities for funding by making funding more transparent Although funding may be available, it is not always accessible. Offer small loans and investment opportunities with easy payback schemes. Make use of universities in developing countries. Link universities so that they are not standing alone and have greater strength. 
use other institutions that can provide training and entrepreneurship schemes. We also need to publish this information, newspapers, newsletters, government information sites, like in Barbados, we've got the GIS, include clubs and religious institutions and network with these institutions. How do we go about it? Um, countries share responsibility in promoting and enabling these guidelines as set up by the UN. Um, so strict monitoring and restrictions, not only on users, but on providers. Providers are accountable. For example, on Friday in Barbados, there was no internet. So if you've got um, e-commerce and you work on the internet, especially from home, and you haven't got the internet, how can you get your work done? Um, so therefore, disruption should be, the public should be notified when there's gonna be a disruption. Um, we also have social media and SMS on most phones, even in developing countries. If one is notified, then one can plan. So if I knew there was gonna be no internet in Barbados on Friday morning, I could easily have done my work on Thursday night. Um, okay, sorry. I'll wrap up um, and consider diversity and improvement of education. Have a computer, a laptop, an iPhone does not always mean that they are used to their full potential. It is up to networking, educational facilities, IT departments, schools, internet societies especially, to outreach and offer basic training to fully enter the next phase of enabling the next billion. Thank you very much, June. Carlos. Hi. Uh, welcome all to the session. Um, well, I, th I thought I was going to start somewhere else, but, but uh, let, me, let me step back a second. I think uh, at the moment many people I don't know, I mean, if you are in this session, probably you know that half of the people in the planet don't, don't have access to the internet. And maybe they don't have access to the internet for several reasons, including skills, including others, but there is also a question of infrastructure. In Africa, for instance, as for today, there is 40% of the people that don't have access to mobile broadband infrastructure. Not because of digital skills, not because of local content, but because of infrastructure per se. Uh, and the main actors, the, those uh, that are represented at the GSMA, are actually recognizing in reports that have come out in the last two months that this is not going to change much in the, la in the next eight years. Actually, the trend is that mobile infrastructure and, and the, the, the pervasiveness in, in rural and remote areas, more, where more of the unconnected live, is not going to grow that much. It's actually plateauing. Uh, so in that context, I think uh, in the introduction, it has been noted that um, there are new actors that are actually contributing to this debate, in uh, 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 increasing the, the, the infrastructure in those areas that uh, traditional market players are not able to, to provide connectivity, right? And this is happening in many cases because the telecommunications landscape, as Stevenson has said in, in some of his writing, is changing, right? Like the value change of, of, the, of the telecommunications network infrastructure is becoming disaggregated. There is, uh, the people can actually invest in the, in the last mile because there are other infrastructure in place in the middle mile and in the back hole that are actually in place for a smaller actors to, to make use of it. There is a huge spread of fiber optic, both uh, intercontinental under sea cables as well as national. I mean, it's, it's booming and in, in many countries the, the pervasiveness of, of fiber is, is, is big and again, it allows smaller operators to, to actually tap, type into, tap into, into broadband infrastructure. There is, there is a huge change in the, in the last few years in, in last mile technologies. Uh, we were mentioning TV wide spaces, GSM, etc. It's not only in the technologies, but in the cost and in the way they are designed for connecting the unconnected in the sense of low, low power, low cost, etc. And there is also some openings and some changes in regulatory environments that are allowing uh, these smaller actors to actually uh, make use of these technologies and, and these changes in the infrastructure to provide affordable and universal access. Um, and yeah, some of these some of these actors, you've mentioned them, and they, they've been cited before, community networks and, and small operators. And I would like to maybe stop on some of them just to highlight the, the, the ones that are in, in the report, uh, just to highlight some of the issues that, that I was mentioning before. One of the, the ones that was described was the Zapotec community in, in Oaxaca, in Mexico. Uh, it's using low-cost GSM uh, autonomous infrastructure that connects via Wi-Fi to their voice over IP provider. And it's, reducing the, it's providing connectivity in places where there was none. And it's doing so because the, the Mexican government is the only one that has set up a, social, a, a set aside for social use of, of a spectrum that is not used by the operators in these areas. 
uh, it would be interesting to see similar examples in other places. Other two examples that are mentioned are TV White Spaces in, in, in Colombia, in particular, with the projects from Colnodo and Lavazza. TV White Spaces is a, is a technology that has a huge potential to increase infrastructure in these remote areas, yet very few countries have actually uh, regulated and gasseted these, 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 these regulations to use these technologies. In, in Colombia, in South Africa, in the, in the US, actually, I read yesterday about a, a very interesting project to, to, to connect libraries uh, in, in the US using TV White Spaces technologies. Why there are no more countries implementing these, these regulations, right? Then we have the tra traditional Wi-Fi uh, that is being used in many places. In the Philippines, you just mentioned it, it's described in, in, in Uganda, in other countries, both for fixed Wi-Fi, I mean long hauls, as well as for access. And then there are other providers. You mentioned Giphy, that is not in the report. Oh, wow, one minute. Oh, wow. Um, okay. That are deploying fiber. Uh, I also wanted to mention that uh, infrastructure, that it's not only that community networks are contributing to SDG 9, they are contributing as well to SDG 8. Many people don't, don't see that they are a small, uh, a small and medium enterprises that are employing people, uh, that are contributing to the digital economy in many ways. There are going to be sessions today and tomorrow where you are going to be able to listen to other case studies, in particular the Gizwatch Lounge tomorrow in room 10 at 1.30, where 43 case studies of community networks are going to be presented. And then around policy and, and regulatory changes that might be important to enable more of this. I think the first one is to recognize these actors, to recognize that in spite of not having had any support from regulatory frameworks, from funding agencies, etc., or very, very little, they are actually thriving and they are actually providing connectivity in places where there was none. Recognizing them as viable actors, I think, is very important from governments and from other stakeholders. And also, access to a spectrum. There is going to be a session later today in room 7 discussing this uh, at 12.30. But access to radio spectrum, as in the case of, of Colombia and in the case of, of Mexico, to other uh, uh, spectrum bands is actually critical for enabling this actor and enabling uh, the, the, the connectivity in, this, in these places where the market is, is failing. I'm, I'm going to leave it there. I, I can maybe talk later about other things. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlos. Um, I also should uh, mention uh, that we have with us here is Jane Coffin from the Internet Society, who has been doing instrumental work in promoting community networks and supporting through a, a wonderful grant program that Internet Society runs, making it possible for experiments like the kind that Carlos is discussing to take place all over the world. So on behalf of us, we thank all of you at the Internet Society for that work as well. Um, our wisdom or Renata here yet? Renata, you're here. So if Renata and Joyce would come join me, we will go to partnerships. And while they're changing, please join me thanking June and Carlos for a very stimulating presentation. Uh, while Renata and Joyce are joining us, to they will be talking about SGC, SDG 17, which is Partnerships for the Goals of Internet Connectivity. Uh, we'll begin with Renata to talk about why there, this issue is important, and Joyce to talk about what lessons we have learned. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, everyone, for participating in the CNB efforts. Um, my uh, area of uh, action, research, whatever, is nine countries long. It's uh, the Amazon region, and we also represent 50% of the world's remaining rainforest. And we have around 10 uh, federal and state universities in the area and several uh, other spaces that are, um, are uh, in the countryside uh, representing these universities. So the SDG 17 is about partnerships, and partnerships are important for people from underserved regions to approach regional challenges globally. The Amazon region activists and indigenous people who want to voice their opinion on the delegation of the dot Amazon domain could only do it with global partners. Best Bits, a civil society group, published a collective manifesto. Mozilla Festival brought us to present to their community 
And they, not only that, uh, through a program called Mozilla Open Leaders, they did capacity building of our indigenous leaders, which are, by the way, 70% women. Uh, Brazil is the world leading killer of environmental activists. So uh, family led by women, specifically in the indigenous regions, are very common. Um, and um, uh, we also, in IGF Brazil, had a workshop on the theme. IGF Colombia and Guiana approached the theme. IGF Ecuador uh, invited us to speak remotely in the session. And ISOC was very uh, important for us because it uh, enabled us through ISOC Blockchain SIG to do a chapter drum project and at Black IGF to formulate the embryo of what we hope someday we'll have the Amazon IGF. I hope you all come. <laughs> and um, we've, we have, for those, we have Caribbean partners because we're all part of the CARICOM, Caribbean Communications Treaty Region. And um, the ICON Global Indigenous Ambassador Program already brought two indigenous uh, fellows for uh, meetings. Uh, we, Duolingo has put Aymara, the Bolivian indigenous language, uh, for, uh, for uh, their new indigenous languages program. It started with the Amazon languages and the Andean, the Ants uh, region languages. And um, the Isaac Indigenous Summit in USA had our online attendance. And little by little, our partnerships expand the nine countries border of the Amazon. And we will never stop. We uh, have just started. Thank you very much for that very inspirational message. Joyce? Thank you, Christopher. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I just wanted to say that um, when you look at the sustainable development agenda, it really requires partnerships um, to achieve those goals between governments, uh, private sector, civil society, academia, and the technical community alike. So the challenge that brings um, the efforts together on all the other 16 um, SDGs, actually. So um, at the same time, when you look at uh, the Tunis agenda, the different stakeholders from the internet ecosystem have agreed that an inclusive and sustainable development cannot be achieved without global success of the internet, which was a big, big statement, it was important. Um, and just like the internet, to achieve the ambitious goals that were set out by the SDGs, we really need to create a network of network, and not only in the technical sense, but also a network of network of humans, of communities. The, um, and if you look at it really, the harder the, the harder the issue you look at, and the ambitious goals of the SDGs is definitely one of them, the, the more multi-stakeholder approach you really need to achieve those goals. Now, um, I've been invited here today uh, with my, my equals hat on, so uh, as uh, vice chair of, uh, of the equals partnership, I wanted to share a little bit about what happened uh, with equals and how we see that uh, this is really a, a successful model. Uh, and I'll sneakily bring in another SDG, which was part of last year's actually, but uh, I'll uh, sneakily bring in SDG 5, uh, which is uh, gender equality. Uh, so we know that uh, the internet is really a, a powerful tool uh, for inclusion. It's probably the most powerful tool for inclusion that the world has ever seen. Um, and uh, we still see that women are trailing behind in uh, use of the internet in access and use of the internet, especially in the developing regions of the world. Now, we still see that there's 250 million fewer women online compared to men. 32% um, fewer women are online compared to men in all of the 47 UN-designated least developed countries. And so the gap of, uh, the gap, these gaps are depriving women of access to social improvement, to economic improvement, to education, to healthcare, to just name a few. The, um, therefore, it's, it's really critical that our work really in connecting the next billion does not leave that part of the population behind, that we really work in including women in connecting, in being connected to the internet. Um, now, um, equals, to really dive into the, into the case study of EQUALS here, EQUALS is a multi-stakeholder partnership bringing together 
representatives from governments, private sector, um, civil society, academia, to really address the issue of um, digital gender gap. And uh, ECOS was founded in 2017, so it's a very young partnership, and it was founded by ITU, UN University, GSMA, UN Women, and International Trade Center. And it's really an example of, of now over 40 organizations, governments, uh, academia, all together, um, that have come together to tackle an issue together. So what we see is that there's a lot of initiatives going on around gender divides. I mean, we all, we all hear them. We hear them a lot at IGFs as well, which is great. Um, there's a lot of amazing initiatives going on. Now, what we saw is that these initiatives very often are happening in a silo, and it's very often smaller local NGOs or smaller organizations that are trying to make a difference. And what the Equals Partnership is really trying to achieve and has in the first year, I have to say, successfully achieved is creating some synergies between organizations, but also involving government so that we actually can get the digital divide, the digital, digital gender divide on the agendas at government level as well. And bringing in the private sector to also bring in some of the important uh, activities, but also funding, let's just say it, uh, to, some of the, uh, to some of the access uh, issues related to digital gender gap. So the, the, coalition, the Equals Partnership has set out four different uh, coalitions. Uh, one is around skills. Uh, we heard some comments uh, around you know, the importance of the development of skills, um, you know, meaningful access, and actually development of skills for people to have meaningful access once they have the connectivity. Um, and so the, um, the, we just have launched the Equals Digital Skills Funds. Please go and check it out and uh, apply if you have any amazing projects. Little call for advertising here. Uh, the, uh, the second part is a leadership, so leadership coalition really working on um, business and leadership for women in the technology sector. Uh, and a number of courses have been developed around that. Um, and then we have the uh, access coalition, of course, which, uh, which is definitely part of the bringing women on the internet, and lastly, the research coalition, which is really putting some numbers to, uh, to what we're doing as well. So um, what we see is that thanks to Equals Partnership, there's a lot more coordination and collaboration happening at local, regional, and sometimes even at global level. So there's a lot more information sharing, but also collaboration in terms of actual projects. Um, and it's something that we definitely need to replicate in other areas as well to make sure that we achieve those ambitious goals that we've set for uh, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, so, um, more information at equals.org, and uh, please feel free to come and chat afterwards. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity, Christopher. Well, thank you very much. Um, the University of Pennsylvania and Monroe Connected is proud to be a supporter of Equals. Um, um, the, the work we're doing on case studies is feeding directly into the project, and the, the best practices form here on gender as well. So, we're delighted with that work, think it is very important. And thank the Internet Society for your speaks here. I mentioned Jane and the work she's doing with community networks earlier. And the fact that two of the other co-conveners of this session are members of ISOC shows ISOC's deep commitment to the issues generally about connecting the enabling the next billion and issues such as equals and gender as well. Uh, as I invite Michael to come join us, please join me in thanking Renata and Joyce for excellent presentations. Excuse me. So just leaving the online address of our project is netcollective.wordpress.com. Thank you. Thank you very much, Renata. So I gather Wisdom is not here yet, correct? I've not seen him. Okay. So uh, uh, unfortunately, one, our MAG speaker who was supposed to introduce this session has uh, probably been detained by the process of getting registered. But Michael uh, Ogia has uh, agreed to do double duty, both talking about the overall importance of the issue as well as talking about the important projects that are going on. Thank you very much, Michael. My pleasure. Thank you uh, for having me. And uh, I'll just say quickly, although I'm here in the official capacity for the, on behalf of the Global Forum for Media Development here being at the IGF, I'm speaking now really uh, with my very personal hat on. Um, sustainability is, uh, is a key um, <coughs> passion for me when it comes to uh, internet policy and it's unfortunately something that we we don't quite address often enough so I really hope to address uh, wider policy gaps uh, or I'm sorry policy gaps under the wider umbrella of sustainability not just specifically to energy um, and really one of my key theses that I've been making for the past year or more than that is that we cannot legitimately uh, discuss internet access without addressing sustainability um, one of the biggest kind of uh, um, 
oversights that I recognize is that uh, there's no actual direct or explicit link between, within the SDG framework between goals seven and goals nine, which I, I think that's, I would say that's actually a grievous oversight. Um, it's not just about things like uh, data center power use. ICT electricity use is growing in general. Um, est uh, current estimates uh, amount, uh, say that uh, ICT energy use is about 10% uh, of all global electricity use, which accounts for about 2 to 3% of all global greenhouse gas emissions. So uh, it's something that is uh, quite relevant, yet the relationship between energy and internet is, although to me it's clear, um, still about uh, well over a billion people um, still lack access to reliable energy, especially within the global south. Um, and according to uh, the Digital D uh, Dividends Report in 2016, um, more people have access to mobile phones than they do to um, reliable energy, uh, or clean water for that matter. So energy and sustainability uh, should consistently be part of our conversations. We should not look uh, back and, and address sustainability in retrospect. It should be integrated into the core of our work, into the core of, uh, of you know, technological design, whether that be devices or networks, et cetera. Um, but as well, sustainability should be a public policy consideration. It should be a basic requirement, um, you know, especially as it relates to uh, things like the Paris Agreement and other, uh, you know, climate and environment related uh, uh, agreements. Um, something else to just take into account is that as data traffic rises, um, with the increase uh, in the number of internet users, uh, the internet of things, machine to machine, uh, you know, uh, tech, uh, traffic, etc. So does energy consumption. Uh, although energy efficiency is rising, so is the amount of, of uh, devices that are uh, connecting to the internet. So is the amount of high definition video that's being consumed per year. So is the amount of, of traffic in general. So these are all Rel uh, very relevant issues that are not getting, unfortunately, enough uh, considerations at the policy level. Um, there has to be uh, an effort made, really, to monitor and address this foreseeable rise in uh, a sustainable way, because it's, you know, right now the, the curve is pr practically exponential when it comes to energy use as it relates to ICTs. So it's something we really need to, to count on, and it's something that Carlos mentioned. Uh, he was talking about how community networks have been such an integral part of connecting to uh, SDG 9 and SDG 8. Well, the fact is they're also uh, such a, a, a big push, or they're such a, a, a big actor when it comes to SDG 7. The community networks are hugely advantageous here because energy and power issues are typically one of the first considerations that community networks have to take into account when they're building community infrastructure, particularly in remote and rural areas. So, you know, this is really a holistic issue, and, and it's one that, uh, that, you know, to me, it's impossible to see SDG 9 and not look at SDG 7. So, uh, Christopher, how are we doing on time? Four minutes. Perfect. So, there's, just, there's a, a few different projects that I want to highlight, and you can read more about them in the document. Um, uh, most, most of them that I know of, a lot of uh, related to SDG 7 are happening uh, throughout Africa. Um, one of them that was already mentioned is MCOPA, and that's happening in Kenya, which provides pay-as-you-go access to clean energy uh, using uh, portable solar panels, uh, bright, efficient LED bulbs, and a charging solution for mobile phones uh, and, and, other, um, and other devices. Um, they've actually reached over 700,000 homes, which is about 3 million people throughout Kenya. Um, who also used to rely on kerosene. So as you see, it's not just about, it's not just energy in general, it's also very much connected to the environment. Um, another, another one that I've, I've followed for quite a long time now, it's called Solar Sister. It's, in, uh, it's, it's also in East Africa, but it's especially in Uganda. And, uh, they and it trains and supports women uh, to deliver clean energy directly to homes in rural Africa um, while providing essential services and training and that enable women entrepreneurs. So we talk about, you know, the partnerships of the goals. You talk about energy, you talk about women. These are absolutely necessary because oftentimes, um, you know, th these are, are where the real changes are happening, especially in households. When you empower women, you, you change households. So uh, very important to consider. Um, and then another one is really interesting is Mesh Power Rwanda, which is happening in, obviously in Rwanda, and they offer pay-as-you-go access to solar power through smart interconnected uh, microgrids that connects off-grid uh, villages. So 
Uh, and then uh, the IEEE has their Smart Village program. It's something that um, that I've I, I think is very interesting because they connect they uh, they do connect power and internet uh, connectivity more uh, more broadly and more specifically. And then um, one that I would really like to to talk about is not really specifically within the umbrella of, of SDG 7, but just as a, a larger one that's talking about sustainability is there's this really great project I like to talk about called Digital Inclusion uh, Luxembourg, and they are holistically addressing uh, refugee inclusion, digital media literacy, skill building, and uh, sustainability, as well as recycling and reusing um, old devices. So, for instance, again, while that's not necessarily related to energy, it is just a really good example of how holistic solutions as they relate to sustainability do exist and you know require a bit of creativity but addressing the challenges as they relate to sustainability as they relate to energy absolutely requires multi-stakeholder collaboration we need industry we need government we need policy solutions we need some you know reviews of supply chains etc um, and obviously we need solar power that's one of the, uh, the biggest considerations, seeing as how most of the people that are coming online now are, uh, you know, if, they're, uh, they, they, if they don't necessarily, if they don't have access to energy, they're not going to be online for very long. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. Please join me in thanking him for his remarks. So the order will proceed from here. We actually have 15 minutes for discussion, for questions from the floor and discussions on general matters of anything involved in the session. Uh, I think that you've been briefed on this before, but the speakers at the end of that will have a 30 so second to one minute to give one key takeaway that you would like the people to, so we'll swing back by all the people who spoke and give them the opportunity to offer their thoughts. And then at the end of this, then uh, Paul Roney on behalf of the MAG will offer some closing remarks to wrap up and I will tell you what will happen next with the project. So at this point, I would like to open the floor to any comments or questions. If you would, uh, two things, make sure you identify yourself and also because we have remote participation and we have interpretation, make sure to use your microphone, please. Yes, thank you very much. This is really ins inspirational. I'm from uh, Myanmar. My name is Dr. Tan Tho Kang. I'm, I'm from the MBABF. Uh, uh, we, what we do is very, according to the Ms. Radhika uh, presentation, I really appreciate using the libraries because what we do is exactly the same. We're using the library network, uh, empowering the local community, uh, giving internet access, uh, devices, training. But we got a support from a lot of international organizations like uh, Microsoft, Gates Foundation, you know, uh, Facebook, uh, Google, and so and so. But what we are lacking in our country is that support from the uh, public sector. We, this year onwards, we're going to have, the government's going to have the universal access fund, US funds is available, but they're going to invest mainly on the infrastructure, mainly on the towers and so and so. So I would like to ask any of you, is there any cases where uh, these US funds are used for the training as well, not just on the infrastructure? This is what we do, you know, that training to the, uh, the digital literacy and media, uh, media literacy trainings through our libraries. Thank you very much. So I can ask, answer directly. In the thousand case database of initiatives we're doing, about half of them are on the demand side. The single largest category is on digital literacy training. And if you look at the studies in Brazil, China, India, but also EU, US, um, digital literacy is the second largest obstacle to adoption. And so what is interesting is what is lacking in the digital literacy training side is a commitment to sustainability. All of them have no revenue models whatsoever. So unless there is a sustained commitment from a government or from a corporate social responsibility donor, those projects will die the minute the funding that ends. And so one of the challenges that uh, many of the community are starting to do with digital literacy training is to try to find the, a way to make them self-sustaining so that the beneficiaries of that training provide some support back into the program so it can continue to scale and expand. But it is clearly an effort that many people are pursuing and it is a critical part of any effort to connect those billions because what we've discovered is without the digital literacy training, we can build all the networks we want. We will still not accomplish the goals that we seek. Jane. 
I would mention a project in the United States for our um, Native American community. It's 19 tribes in Southern California. And Matt Rantanen is here. You will recognize him as a very tall guy with a beard and long hair. He's usually in a three-piece suit um, and some cowboy boots. Uh, we've worked very closely with Matt on indigenous connectivity. He has a specific example where their community network project wasn't charging, and when they did start to charge, and it is self-sustainable, it does fund itself now, people found more value in the network because in some regions, free doesn't have value. And Matt is creating a sustainable, it is sustainable, it is connected, and there is some public funding. And there are lots of projects in the United States as well, believe it or not. <laughs> There's a lack of connectivity, a lot of it. Um, where the government has funded schools, libraries, and hospitals under a specific legislation, and that was under the Obama administration. So there's a lot of public funding going in to libraries in particular as well. And we're very lucky to have IFLA and Eiffel here this week. You should definitely talk to them. And right in front of you <laughs> is Leandro Navarro from Guifi, and he knows a lot about the library uh, work, as does Colnodo. Julian Casas Buenas is sitting here as well, and Valeria Betancourt as is Don Means, who's joining us as well. And Don knows a lot about TV white space yes. and connectivity and libraries. Yes. So, uh, please. Good morning. My name is Jerry Ellis. I'm from Dublin in Ireland, uh, here from the Dynamic Coalition on Accessibility and Disability, and I'm blind myself. There are 1.3 billion people with disabilities in the world and probably disproportionately high, even higher than that percentage in developing and, and third world countries. Um, the thing about people with disabilities is not only do they not have access to the internet, like the rest of society, but they often don't have access to the alternatives, such as paper-based systems and inaccessible education, inaccessible buildings or whatever. So if you develop systems which exclude these people, they are then doubly excluded because they don't have access to the new technologies which are made available to the rest of society. If they don't have access to them, they also don't have access to the alternatives. The Sustainable Development Goal mentions disability 11 times. And uh, my request just today is that every system that you're putting in place or funding or whatever, ensure that you include the needs of people with disabilities. Thank you. Well, thank you for those important comments. I know from the case studies we've done, the both encouraging and discouraging news is that there are some but relatively small number of disability access focused initiatives. Uh, it is a different challenge uh, in terms of connecting more people to the internet, which we cannot resolve simply by building additional networks. Uh, in reference to the comments that Jane made and the most recent comment, uh, there is a session being held on hybrid business models, which are not entirely privately focused, in, but also combined federal fund, uh, government funding, uh, being held tomorrow in Sal 8 at 410, and on disability acts that, it, that one will connect that is participating in. And tomorrow in room 3 at 1150, there is a session being held on access, accessibility improved building inclusive societies with AI, and one of the goals of that I, is about increasing disability access as well. So, Jerry, again, just to say, in room three tomorrow morning from nine o'clock, there are three sessions on a row, in a row on disability. I'll be during the middle one at ten past ten. So, there are actually three sessions on accessibility. Wonderful. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, any other questions or comments? Please. Hi, uh, my name is Eric Huerta with, from Raisomatica. Uh, just to call the attention on. on two of the presentations that, the, that, that were done. Um, it comes, I mean, it made me think a lot the, the two approaches that I saw in solving uh, the problems of unattended areas or atten unattended connectivity areas. Um, one of the models, may, or many models mentioned by the person from Philippines, Philip, <laughs> um, and, and also, um, the solution talks by Carlos Rey Moreno no, on, on both sides. I think it's, it's important to rethink 
how we approach to the problem and how do we consider new ways of uh, new models that are not necessarily um, based on the same architecture of the network and think different ways of architecture of the network in which communities could do those, those parts that are not um, um, that, that, are, uh, that probably are, are, are the expensive ones for a traditional operator. Mm -hmm. For a traditional operator, maybe sometimes it's very expensive to manage the network within the community, but that could be done by the community and make it sustainable and not needing to find someone to pay for the, for the use of the internet, rather that the community could use those uh, income generated by the community to, to, to manage the network and to pay the fee probably for the other uh, the connectivity that goes out from that community. So it just was, I want to call that the attention of the, uh, of the whole. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. It's uh, important, I think, it's a very appropriate coming from Rhizomatica because for those of you who do not know, Rhizomatica has created a microcell architecture in Oaxaca, Mexico, that is going into areas where traditional carriers were not willing to serve using a traditional cellular technology on a small scale basis. I'm very proud that they're one of the uh, things we cover in our report and not just because the founder, Peter, is a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania. So, um, and I've also wanted to recognize the, the Myanmar Book Foundation is also one of our case studies. We are happy to share the excellent efforts that all of you are making in behalf of trying to connect more people into a very, one of the areas that needs connectivity the most. So we really appreciate it and we hope that sharing these stories helps generate some energy and some ideas about new ways of doing things to start to think of different solutions such as the paid Wi-Fi model that, uh, the paid models that we've seen coming out of uh, Rhizomatica and other places. Renata. Please. So I just wanted to contribute to Eric's point about uh, where do you get um, the community to participate, where do you get the resources. This becomes even more difficult when you have nomad communities. So for example in the Amazon what happens is that you have tribes that are always by the riverside and they're always moving. If they ha there are some threat, for example from uh, wood uh, uh, makers and or uh, land grabbers, they will move. So that's an extensive network of rivers. And what we do uh, count on is to have um, routers on boats, on small boats, uh, canoes sometimes, uh, passing along uh, to share the connectivity uh, in, the, in the villages. I have a student, she lives on Monday, uh, on Sunday for a class on Wednesday in the, in the capital and during the whole day she goes community to community using internet, using maybe mo mes mostly mobile messaging to, to teach students. And then on Thursday she comes back, so she spends six, six days a week uh, riding uh, on the rivers, sharing connectivity and one day a week only in the capital get, getting resources. So we cannot really count with anyone because we are not going to be, we are not going to know where we are and which are the communities that can help us. But we need to create fast and reliable ways of connectivity uh, to, to exchange among ourselves. Also I would like to say that we're counting this story also on uh, we are telling the story also on the launch of the Gizwatch. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we probably have time for one more comment, if there is one, please. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you very much. It was a very interactive uh, session, and I have really enjoyed uh, being here. Uh, my name is uh, Mohammed Azizi, and I'm the chairman of the Regulatory Authority of Afghanistan. Uh, one point which I uh, uh, basically realized from this discussion is that uh, uh, there are a couple of different actors uh, that are involved uh, in order to make sure that 
uh, we have uh, a solution for the uh, issues of uh, accessibility, but then uh, what uh, probably Michael mentioned is uh, accessibility versus uh, meaningful uh, accessibility. Uh, and uh, I think uh, we have to really uh, understand one fact that it is a real multi-stakeholder uh, effort that will give us the success. Uh, the government and the regulators, they can only uh, work on the soft sides uh, of the uh, equation, uh, whereas uh, the industry comes with the solutions. Uh, but when it comes to the uh, users, uh, there we have got a number of uh, different stakeholders. And uh, what uh, I really uh, uh, appreciate is that uh, you have brought the people who, as the nonprofits and as the uh, real players in the field, uh, they have shared their experiences. So I think uh, the message that I would like to convey is that we really have to uh, strengthen the bond uh, in order to make sure that all these stakeholders uh, on a continuous basis work together. Thank you. Well, thank you for that important perspective. What we've learned the hard way is that, yes, the industry is the backbone of a lot of the deployments, and the government plays a key role. Uh, government funding is limited, and the industry's ability to reach the entire country will not be sustainable based on their obligations as going enterprises. So that is where hybrid business models, community networks, uh, funding, seed funding on capital expenditure by USF, that is on sustainable projects, can be understanding how to use and marshal all the different parts of the resources becomes critical. And that's why I think a venue like the Internet Governance Forum, with its deep commitment to broad representation of every multi-stakeholder group, is important because it emphasizes that we are not enemies, we are collaborators. We are all pushing towards the same goal and that we need to find the, the best way to maximize the limited resources that we have so that they benefit as many people as possible. And so I thank you for your comment. Um, at this point, um, I will close the open part of the participation. Um, I will re invest, uh, reiterate, this is only midway part of the process. We have a draft report out, which I encourage all of you to look and consider. Uh, if, for those of you who um, uh, would like to give input, we would very much welcome any suggestions you have to improve the report. If you have a project that is not mentioned, we really depend on a submission process for people to generate information for the report. If you, would, if you feel that your project should have been included, I will say anything that was included in the 2017 report we did not repeat because of just the, no, the lack of a need to repeat ourselves. But if there is something you would like to be included, we would very much welcome your contribution and would find a way to make sure that it is incorporated before the final output. And again, I would invite anyone who's interested in these case, story, case study oriented presentations to consider joining the Dynamic Coalition meeting tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. in room 11. So at this point, I will now open, allow each of our participants to give one key takeaway if they would like to, uh, just uh, to, but uh, and the plea in the essence of time to keep it relatively short, if I may. Uh, why don't we start over here, Mary. Do you have anything you would like to share as a last thought? And please use the microphone because of the remote participation. Thank you very much. Um, as I said, since we are looking at economic development from connecting the next billion, uh, there must be fair distribution of the gains of what the new technology will bring. That's one. The, other se the second thing is that there must be proper reward for those, the developers, those that have uh, developed new uh, uh, networks or new, new application or uh, uh, startups. There must be uh, proper reward. And not, you know, when we bring children together, they, 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 they come up with ideas and at the end of them, at the end of the, 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 the program, the, the businesses would go make a lot of money from, from that, from that uh, 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 development. So how are those, those ones that did the development rewarded? Thank you. Thank you. June, did you want to share anything? Hi, reminder, I'm
and June. Uh, at the end of the day, as Mary said, businesses will make money from um, good connections and everything. But I, I'm going to say we rely on connecting tools like WebEx, Zoom, Skype, WhatsApp. But none of them work really without a good Wi-Fi connection. My problem is Wi-Fi connections, as you realize by now. Um, we, we make payments online using various methods. But again, we need a good connection to do this. How can we work in e-commerce without good connections? We email and text, and we need a service. And we also need a network provider to do so. Thank you, Chair. Joyce? Thank you, Christopher. Um, I'll keep it very brief. I think we all heard from, uh, from the various people speaking today that um, the partnerships and collaboration is really key. Um, I think uh, whether we speak about community networks, whether we speak about energy, whether we speak about uh, digital skills development, w whichever of the topics we talked about today, none of them would actually have any, s any form of success if we didn't actually actively collaborate and uh, partner with each other to come to connecting that next billion. Um, so um, I, I truly hope we can, uh, this forum actually allows for even more partnerships that uh, we can make more connections and that we can actually enhance the, the work we're doing together, scale the work we're doing together and actually uh, get to the end goal that we all believe in. So, um, and uh, on equals in particular, uh, obviously uh, I hope we can replic replicate that model in some of the other SDGs that we're working on as, uh, together. Um, and uh, I just want to thank you for, for being here and for being so passionate about this topic that uh, I think we all share. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce. Renata. So I will just emphasize something very important. Partnerships are not dependence. So partnerships are about collaboration, are about mutual exchange. You can imagine that for us in the Amazon region, a very well-known uh, online retailer came with some very nice offers for us for social projects, but um, we, what we want is not to be dependent on a partner because we know that that's not going to be long lasting. We need to have our own way of doing things in our community. So uh, partnerships are about being honest to each other, uh, finding what you have to give and what you need from uh, other stakeholders. We had. Uh, a very impressive participation from municipal government stakeholders who climb trees and put our routers there. And this is like something they do voluntarily. So uh, it's completely different from uh, what uh, be the color offer you uh, expect. Thanks. Carlos. Thank you. Um, for me, I think is. Um, is the point of you were talking about resources and how to sell resources and how do we see the connecting and enabling the next billion as something that is a market failure and therefore we need to start thinking outside the market and sharing those resources in a way that enables social development instead of profitability. I'm not sure I agree with you that it's a question of sustainability. I think it's a question of affordability because there are a lot of enough a lot of resources from fiber to spectrum to towers that are there to be used and to make these cases affordable and sustainable that people are not willing to share because they still want to take the last cent of the cent of the people that don't have money. So I think if we start rethinking outside the box and sharing resources to enable and connecting the next billion in terms of infrastructure and in terms of affordability, I think we could make a different case than the one that we are making today. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I think that's the uh, kind of the different school of thoughts that we're trying to deal with right now. So uh, when we're talking about affordability and sustainability uh, from a private enterprise point of view, our experience has been in the Philippines that it's not a question of technology. I think you're right. There's a lot of fiber available. There's even the low earth orbit uh, technology that's coming on board soon. And I think it's not a question of whether there's enough technology to serve um, the, the, the majority of people. I think it's a question of who pays for that technology. How do we find the monetization model that will offer this service for free? And when you mentioned earlier that free probably doesn't add 
add enough value, I think it's free to the user, but somebody eventually has to pay for it. And that's what we're trying to figure out, is what's that model that will make it sustainable so that private enterprise uh, corporations would be willing to spend to make this happen. And I think that's the journey of what we're trying to go through right now. Michael. Yeah, I, I just want to be very clear about something. We, you know, according to the latest IPCC report, the Inter International uh, Panel on Climate Change, we have about 13 years to fix the earth, um, more or less. Sorry to be a downer. But, um, you know, energy is such a key consideration. We, again, we cannot legitimately discuss internet access without discussing um, environmental energy sustainability. We cannot be retroactive with the way that we think about it. It needs to be integrated into the core design of networks, of our technology, etc. cetera. And I'm, I don't think that's the case. We need to work actively, collaboratively, to ensure that happens, and it needs to happen yesterday. Well, I think that one of the key takeaways for me is, is the need to think outside the box. I was thinking about um, in our case studies, we have three Amazon case studies, including one that is using Cold War era ham radio towers to supplement connectivity, which I think is a brilliant idea to leverage existing architecture, which many people had thought had become obsolete. We'll see if that actually works, but I think that's one of these great creative ideas that can work out. I think Michael's point earlier is that it is systemically all part of the same problem and one of the issues that we may solve the cost problem in connectivity is by thinking about it jointly with energy and other issues. Many times the communications network will ask, you know, is there electric power? Interestingly, there are case studies we have where the communication network became established for its own sake and then became the first source of electric power the other direction. So it wasn't communications following power, it was power following communications. And in fact, when we can think about them as joint revenue models that provide overall services to communities, it may create new ways of solving problems that our hope is to study more and more and to share in continuing generations of the IGF. That's just what this project is for. Uh, we've uh, reached almost the end. At this point, I will turn the microphone over to, Paul, uh, to MAG member Paul Roney, who not only helps organize the IGF and demotes his time very generously to that, as do all the MAG members, but himself is a person who is, offers uh, technical support and helps build networks in Africa. Thank you very much, Paul. Okay, th thank you, and uh, thank you <coughs> to everyone for being here. We really appreciate your support. Uh, as mentioned, I'm a member of the MAG. I'm uh, one of the co-facilitators of uh, this group, and I'm speaking on behalf of Renata, who had to leave, unfortunately. Uh, as mentioned, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a TV white space guy. I'm, I'm the guy that uh, climbs the towers and uh, gets <laughs> some communities connected. Uh, there's been discussion on, on the MAG, if the CNB is, is still relevant, and it's something we're still debating. I think it is. I think there's uh, still a lot of challenges. Uh, we've almost got 50% of people connected, which means we've got over 50% that are still disconnected. Uh, there's been a slowdown. Uh, we've got countries, and specifically in Africa, uh, we tend to miss our broadband targets. So this raises the questions why, you know, what is changing? Uh, we made progress. We don't seem to be making so much progress. Uh, we, we need to uh, support, I think, community-based networks. There's a lot of talk about uh, community-based networks. We often don't have uh, frameworks in our countries that actually are now allow these to thrive and this is problematic. Uh, there's often the belief that uh, the telcos, existing telcos, will connect the next billions. Uh, there's a big push for 5G. Uh, the big conferences are on 5G. 5G is not going to connect. It's, if anything, it's going to widen uh, that gap. It's really not going to narrow it, but the debate on that, I guess, is, 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 is open. Uh, there's talk about uh, using libraries. There's uh, other technologies. Uh, we, we need to embrace all technologies. We need to look at spectrum. There's a lot of unused, unutilized spectrum, uh, which is just being kept there. It, it, it's, we're, we're not getting access to it. Uh, our regulators want to monetize it, which is problematic because that uh, impacts affordability. Uh, we've got uh, different uh, entities that have their own uh, drives, which are not necessarily driving towards uh, digital inclusion. Uh, we've got USS funds that are underutilized or misused. Um, you know, it, it, it goes on. Where, where I live, uh, you know, with the push for 5G, and Africa's pushing towards 5G, most of our citizens still don't have edge. 
So, you know, what, what, what do we really want to achieve? And is there really the political will anyway to connect to all of our citizens? You know, that, that's also something we need to ask ourselves. So, really, in, in closing, uh, I need to thank uh, everybody here that's participated, and that includes yourselves, uh, being part of the process, all of those that uh, have uh, put uh, their thought processes into this. I, I need to thank uh, Christoph on my left, uh, who has facilitated this. So, so I j and I need to just correct you, who uh, is not here is Raquel, Raquel, and I am Renata. So we okay. are the interchangeable yes. presidents. <laughs> I'm the much less okay. smarter one. <laughs> Apologies there. And uh, the, the, the uh, co-facilitators on the MAG, and uh, of course, uh, just to close, because we all want to run off, uh, Radhika on my right, who's been instrumental for making this the, the session that it has been. So thank you. Well, thank you very much, Paul, for your support. Um, as Paul indicates, whether there will be a phase five of CENB is a matter that will be discussed by the MAG forthcoming. If you think this type of work is worth continuing, I would encourage you to approach Paul, um, Mary, June, the other members of the MAG who are here, uh, and share with them your thoughts. Uh, if you are interested in participating, please read the report, give us your input, and if you have a project you think that should be included, we really would welcome your input. If you're interested in this case study work, I encourage you to come to the Dynamic Coalition on Innovative Approaches to Connecting the Unconnected, which will be meeting at 9 o'clock in Room 8, and stop by our village in uh, Booth 1 in the village at One World Connected. And with that, I declare this meeting adjourned.